I'd like to tell you a story this afternoon about a fish. The story's called The Last Gold Eye, and that's really what it is. It's a story that, in effect, the fish have told me. Fish are a really good animal to explain what's been happening over the whole landscape, because when you look at a, a valley, a landscape, the water flows downhill, down into the river, into the lake where the fish live. Fish can really teach us a lot about what's happening over the landscape. And, and this story really explains what's been happening over the Alberta landscape to a lot of our smaller lakes and rivers. It's a fascinating story that isn't really coming through from a human perspective. The human view of Alberta's lakes, rivers, water, is that our rivers flow from these pristine, protected mountain landscapes, Banff and Jasper. And that's really the human view of uh, two-thirds of Albertans who live in Edmonton, Calgary, where these big rivers, the Bow and the North Saskatchewan, do flow from these very protected mountain landscapes where there's not much land use. Our water comes from protected areas. That's not how fish see the world. <laughs> Fish's view that protected landscapes have nothing to do with us. This is a map of the 132 tertiary watersheds. Tertiary watersheds are the watersheds in Alberta that are sort of the named little rivers. Of those, there's only about 22 of those watersheds originate in a protected mountain landscape. Most of those watersheds, 80%, originate not in the mountains. They originate in landscapes that look like this. Very heavily developed landscapes with um, Lots of oil roads, lots of well sites, lots of uh, highways, towns, uh, agricultural development, forestry development. This is where, from a fish's viewpoint, most of the water is coming from. A very heavy footprint, not from protected mountain landscapes, but very heavily developed footprints. This is what Alberta looks like to a fish. Lots of roads, lots of silt coming in, lots of nutrients, just lots of things happening on the landscape. And Alberta is a really busy place. Uh, here's the human population from 1900 to 2000, just skyrocketing. When I was born back in 1950s, um, a million people, over three and a half million in Alberta now. Here's the cow population, you know, they outnumber us uh, two to one, about six million cows in Alberta now. Out poop is something like 32 to one. Very busy place. Uh, cumulative area of cut blocks in Alberta, skyrocketing. Cumulative amount of seismic lines, Back in the early years, of course, there's hardly any seismic lines in Alberta. Now there's about 1.4 million kilometers of seismic lines, enough to go from Earth to the moon three times. Huge number of, huge amount of development on the landscape. And this is a story about development in, in one of those sets of landscapes. This is a story about the Battle River, which is fairly typical central Alberta prairie parkland watersheds. Um, beautiful, beautiful landscape, sort of that rolling prairie parkland stuff. And it's a story about this guy, the gold eye. He's a classic um, Alberta prairie parkland, river fish, great big eye to see in silty water, flat fish to go through the fast water. Um, used to be really abundant in this tributary of the North Saskatchewan River called the Battle River. We know it was abundant because we listened to stories that old folks tell us. Um, the First Nations people have been here a lot of years. They use, value, have a lot of stories about Alberta's lakes, waters, and fish. This was a really neat story that a gentleman out of the Hobima area told me a few Christmases back. Uh, Harley Lewis was his name, and we were talking, and he said um, this fascinating tale. He remembers his grandpa taking him down to fish traps on the Battle River. And he said we'd catch enough fish to fill the saddlebags and, and ride back to the village for a big feed of fish with our families. That's a fascinating story from two aspects. One. There were fish traps in the Battle River. And this is about where the Battle River would have crossed Highway 2, the Calgary-Edmonton Highway. There's fish traps there. There's enough fish to trap. And two, you could eat them. You can do neither of those things now. This is about the 1940s, Harry Lewis felt that was. We fast forward about 30 years to one of the fisheries biologists in Alberta. This is Dave Christensen, who is uh, the main guy in Rocky Mountain House with Fish and Wildlife now. He said he started with Fish and Wildlife in about 1977. His first summer job was they basically gave him a canoe and a gill net and said, go tell us how the Battle River works. He said he spent the whole summer just canoeing across Alberta, um, catching fish, talking to people. That's a key part, talking to people. You can learn so much about an ecosystem by setting a gill net, by sampling the fish, but you can learn so much by listening to the stories that people, people tell you. And he said that locals were telling him how by the late 70s, the big runs of gold eye that Harley Lewis was talking about were almost gone. You could only catch decent numbers below Forestburg, about halfway down the river. 
And it was really evident in the 70s things were going downhill. Big kills of fish, low oxygen levels, and just the stories people said that this river is going downhill. That was the 1970s. Fast forward to the mid-2000s, 2005, the Battle River Watershed Association came to me and said, can you do one of your fishery studies to look at biodiversity on the, uh, on the Battle River? Biodiversity, what kinds of fish are there? We've heard the, uh, the elder stories about, you know, it used to be lots, the stories from Fish and Wildlife that it was going downhill in the 70s. What's happened in 2000? So we did a study where we electrofished along the river catching fish. These yellow circles here are the places we electrofished. Each one was about two kilometers long. So we shocked all the way from Pigeon Lake in the upper part of the watershed all the way to the Saskatchewan border. Um, put a lot of electrons in the water, sampled a lot of river. We caught seven gold eye in three summers. One fish outside of Camp Wainwright. One fish. That might have been the last gold eye in the Battle River. We caught a lot of other fish, white suckers and minnows. Um, the diversity was gone. The sensitive fish, the walleye, the burbot, the pike were almost gone. The gold eye were basically gone. And the fish that were there weren't healthy. We were seeing a lot of lesions, open sores on the white suckers. We were seeing blood vessels breaking on their tails. Uh, and this wasn't just the Battle River. We were seeing this in the other smaller rivers we sampled that don't originate in Banff and Jasper and those protected watersheds. We would see suckers like this with lots of parasites on them. We would see fungal infections on their fins. We would see tumors on them. We would see um, uh, fungal, uh, bacterial infections coming off their fins, just really gross stuff. You wouldn't want to eat this fish. Um, body parts missing, deformed body parts. Something had really happened to the fish community. These fish were sick, and there's only a few species left. Well, what had happened was the landscape had really changed. What used to be a forest and a wetland on the edges of the river had become fields, plowed right up to the edge. That means that nutrients and sediments can run right into the river. That means groundwater, which used to sink in all spring and summer when the rains would come and would sink in and create springs in the wintertime, would keep a little bit of open water where the fish would get some oxygen, those springs were gone. The groundwater just runs straight off the surface now into the river. Um, when it's running straight down, it used to hit shorelines that would have cattails and willows and poplars along them and those that vegetation would suck up the nutrients but those shorelines are gone now the the natural filters coming off are gone the springs the habitats were gone um, we were seeing lots of livestock throughout the watershed trampling down that uh, pooping in the creek and i don't mean to to slag agriculture we all grew up on on family farms in alberta if you go far enough back but what we're seeing in a lot of parts of alberta aren't the family farms we grew up with uh, Here's a great graph from the year 1900 to 2000 showing the number of farms in Alberta. You can see it kind of peaked in the 1930s. The number of farms has declined since then. The number of farms in Alberta these days is the same as it was in the First World War. The number of farms has gone way down. The size of farms has more than doubled. These are very different farms. Back in the 1930s, half of Albertans used to farm. Half the population farmed. Nowadays, less than 5% farms. And of those 5% Albertans that farm, something like 75, 80% can't make a full-time living on the farm. All the farmers you know have jobs as welders in town at a metal fabrication plant working in the oil field. It's not a money-making business anymore. Intensive agriculture, you put a lot more on the land, but it's not creating the same benefits it used to. We have to put a lot more into it, too. This is a great graph of fertilizer sales in Western Canada, 1970 to 2000. In Grandma's day, Grandpa's day, they would summer follow. They would put a little bit of manure on the fields. Now it's tons and tons of fertilizer pouring onto those fields. A lot more intensity. And the intensity is, is not happening everywhere. This is a fascinating graph. This is the famous um, manure production graph where the the Agriculture Canada poo graph. <laughs> These are all the little tertiary watersheds throughout Canada. The intensity of color is the amount of manure produced on those watersheds. So um, pale is not much manure. Dark red is very large amounts of manure. So looking at this, you can tell that the two key areas of manure production in Canada are, well, obviously Ottawa, but also <laughs> the Edmonton-Calgary corridor, right? 
This is not happening throughout Canada, this intensive intensity of agriculture. This is a central Alberta phenomena. This is not like the rest of Saskatchewan or Manitoba. And remember, these are the watersheds that are the headwaters of where the fish that I was just talking about live. This is where the water starts from. This is not a protected landscape. This is the heaviest industrial agricultural landscape in Canada. And all those nutrients, all those manure, that manure has to flow somewhere. Every bureaucrat knows that manure flows downhill. And it flows down and should be intercepted before it gets to water. It should go into wetlands. It should go into forests. And a functioning wetland, a functioning forest acts as a water filter. So those nutrients get caught up in cattails, get caught up in willows, and don't get down into the water. So a functioning wetland, a functioning forest acts as a filter. <laughs> that is not a functioning forest. A functioning ecosystem is more than a little strip of vegetation we might leave beside a stream. This allows all those nutrients to get right in. And we've lost a lot of those functional forests, functional wetlands. This is a fascinating map from Ducks Unlimited showing part of the Vermilion River watershed. Um, these colored dots, the green, the blue, the orange, are wetlands that used to be there. The blue are the ones that are still there. The red and the pale orange are the ones that are drained and lost. Just look at all the color on that map. The only filters left are the blue things. There's a lot of land that doesn't act as a sponge, as a filter anymore, to catch all those nutrients. And because they're not caught on the land, they go right into the few remaining bits of water and concentrate it. When you concentrate nutrients in water, you get green water. Dave Schindler, famous re water researcher in Canada, showed this really well. The question back in the 1970s was, hey, a lot of the water is turning green, especially in eastern Canada. Could this be from phosphates coming from our detergents, or could it be from carbon and nitrogen? So a lot of the scientists with the, the big um, detergent companies said, oh, it can't be phosphates in our product. It must be carbon and nitrogen, other things. Dave Schindler did this great experiment where he took this lake in northern Canada and put a net across the narrows where the nutrients couldn't go across, and he put carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphate, no phosphate. And when a few months, the side with the phosphate turned green. Here's a color photograph of it, turned green. Phosphate makes water turn green. I have a bunch of sick fish in the Battle River. Algae creates oxygen, which is good for fish. But it also is a plant, which means at night it uses up oxygen. Our question was, could the phosphorus that's coming in from all the manure and the lack of filters be creating this algae. So could it be, be having this fluctuation of lots of oxygen in the daytime, low oxygen at night. Lots of oxygen in the daytime, low oxygen at night. When I go to the daytime and measure my streams, our streams in Alberta, we seem to have lots of oxygen in them, very high levels. But could, the, could we be getting a fluctuation and just causing stress to the fish? So we did a really neat study. We went to the North Saskatchewan River a human-focused river, all our water from Reverton comes from the North Saskatchewan, but it comes from BAMP, protected watersheds. And I looked at oxygen measurements in the North Saskatchewan, right by Edmonton, over about a five-day period. This is oxygen on this, this axis, and you can see it's sort of fluctuating a little bit. It's up around 10 parts per million in the daytime. It goes down a little tiny bit and up it in the daytime and down at night and up in the daytime and down at night. It's up around 10. If it gets down around 6, 5.5, 6, 6.5, fish start to be in trouble. That's originated in the mountains. Let's look at a stream immediately adjacent to this that just originates in a, a watershed that fish would use a lot of. Conjuring Creek starts up at Wizard, Wizard Lake, entirely agricultural developed. This, at the same dates, was the oxygen fluctuations in Conjuring Creek. Very high in the daytime, very low at night. Very high in the daytime, very low at night. Not enough to cause a fish kill, but it's as if I went into your bedroom every morning with a pillow and just stuck my pillow over your face and suffocated you just for a few minutes every morning. After a while, you'd start to get a little nervous. You'd start to get a cold. The cold would turn into pneumonia. After a while, pneumonia would become leukemia. I asked our fish pathologists, what's wrong with these fish from the Battle River, the Beaver River, the Beaver Lodge River? 
And they said, everything is wrong with these fish. They've got parasites, they've got tumors, they've got viral infections, they've got bacterial infections. They have no immune system. I showed them this. They said, yeah, that could cause them enough stress that their immune system is gone. And they're just susceptible to everything in the landscape. It's not enough to kill them, but it's enough to cause them enough stress that the very sensitive species, the gold eye, are gone. This could be the mechanism. So what did we learn on the Battle River? Well, this was fascinating. We would, we would shock in these places, and we could basically do, when we would shock at one of these circles, we could give a report card to the bucket of fish we would catch. And if we would catch, um, you know, walleye, pike, burbot, the types of fish that the, the elders at Hobima would tell us used to be there, it would get a, a blue circle. And if we caught those sick white suckers that I was showing you, it would get a red circle. Lots of red circles, no blue circles, a few green circles down by Camp Wainwright. And this was fascinating. We could take each report card, each spot, and say, well, what was the conditions in the stream? What were conditions on the shoreline? What were conditions in the area? And what we found was the best predictor, the best indicator of what was in my bucket of fish was actually what the landscape looked like not immediately adjacent to the stream, not a kilometer from the stream, but within the 10 kilometers on each bank. And this was fascinating. Um, this was an index of how much human footprint, how much human activity was within that township, six miles, 10 kilometers, immediately adjacent to the spot where I would electrofish the bucket of fish. This would be fairly low development, this would be fairly high development, and this would be the report card that that bucket of fish would tell us. Um, you'd go fishing if it was up in the 80 to 100% range and maybe a, a teenager on his bike, if he had nothing else to do, would go fishing because he couldn't get to a good lake, would go fishing in here. But this is where the really sick white suckers lived. And what we found was in places that the landscape looked pretty good, like up in the headwaters near Battle Lake or in uh, Canadian Forces Base Wainwright, um, not much human footprint and the fishing was iffy. There's still a few walleye, still a few pike. Remember, this is where we found the only gold eye. But as we got heavier and heavier footprints, that report card got worse, worse, and worse. This is fascinating. I could look in the bucket of fish, and by looking at the biodiversity, was it walleye and burbot and a bunch of different things, or was it just sick white suckers? I could look at that bucket and tell you what was happening 10 kilometers that way. The fish were telling me that story. This is what we call a dose response curve. The dose was how much human footprint we put on the landscape. The response was what the fish tell us. This is a really useful thing for planning because people could ask me, hey, if we um, put a bunch more development in this watershed and maybe put it up from this number to a much higher number, what would happen to the fish? And I would go, well, based on this, they wouldn't like it. Well, how much less development do we have to put on the landscape to really bring back walleye fishing? And I'd say, well, somewhere back in here, just dropping it by a few percentage points isn't going to bring your fishing back. This is a really useful thing. It can't predict the future, but it can surely tell us the trends and the general things we have to do to bring fishing back or to make all our fish go away. Really useful for planning. And that's the next part of this story. Um, the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance, fascinating group of um, basically the, the environmental agencies working in the North Saskatchewan watershed, right from Banff to the Saskatchewan border. Um, really cool group of folks. They, you know, they have all the, the fancy motherhood statements. Our purpose is to protect and improve the water quality and ecosystem function in the watershed. And we're also supposed to provide advice to the government on what we want our watershed to look like. So they came to me and said, could you do a, a computer modeling project to look at cumulative effects? What might this future watershed look like? And they wanted me to use the ALCES model to explore possible scenarios, futures that the watershed may look like. So I used this computer model to understand the cumulative effects. Now, we throw this word around a lot, cumulative effects, and it sort of means different things to different people. But the way I like to explain it is this. Um, Women have an intuitive understanding of what cumulative effects are. Us married guys have a functional, iffy understanding. Here's how that would work. Suppose a dinner guest on average eats two or three slices of pizza. We call that the intensity of something on the landscape. <laughs> 
Hi, honey. I'm on my way home in the car. I got four extra people in the car for dinner tonight. That's the magnitude of the problem. My wife, who understands cumulative effects, can immediately go, okay, there's four of us already at home. That's eight people going to be for dinner. At three slices each is 24 slices. At uh, six slices per pizza, we're going to need four pizzas. My wife can do the cumulative effects analysis instantly in her head. That's just the cumulative effects, but it doesn't mean anything until you compare it to something. We need four pizzas. There are three in the oven. You are so in the doghouse. That's the threshold and consequences of cumulative effects. The ALC's model does precisely the same thing. What's the footprint on the landscape? How much of that is there? Multiply the two together. That's how much is going to be. What is that compared to what it used to be or what it might be for some threshold we put? Very simple equation multiplied 40,000 times. Here's an example with water quality. We know that, um, just using the same, the same equation, we know that um, nutrients run off the landscape, phosphates, nitrates, cause algae blooms. This is a great shot of uh, Lake Winnipeg and <laughs> getting all the nutrients from the North Saskatchewan Basin into it. We know that different types of land use have different amounts of nutrient runoff. So cows have a lot of nutrients coming in, you know, crops do another amount of nutrients, but naturally there's also natural erosion getting nutrients in. Each one of those things has a different amount of nutrients coming onto the landscape. Well, we can look at using the ELSI's model and say, well, natural forests on average, how much comes off a field of natural forest? It might be 0.2 kilos per hectare. Um, cultivated crops might be 10 times that. Uh, towns and villages might be 0.2. You can get these numbers from the literature. I look at this, feedlots, 250 kilos per hectare. I graph it and I go, oh my goodness, this is uh, the four types of land use. This is how much phosphate is coming off each land use. As a fish biologist, I look at this graph and I go, feedlots, there's my problem. We got to get rid of those damn feedlots. My wife, who understands cumulative effects, would say, yeah, but how many are there? The other part of the LC's model uses the imagery, imagery from the satellites and says, well, what's the amount of hectares in the basin and how much is in each of these land uses? So we can simply do that. And there's a couple million hectares in forests and crops and about this many hectares in feedlots. And uh, that's the graph of that. And my wife, who understands cumulative effects, says, OK, multiply this by this and tell me where you're getting the most nutrients from. This is grade two math, but I can't do this in my head. I can't multiply this by this and get a number and compare it. The computer can do that instantly. We do that and we get, oh my God, a very non-intuitive answer. Feedlots produce lots of nutrients per feedlot, but that's not where it's all coming from because there's so few feedlots. It's all coming from crops. But is that a problem? What was that compared to something? The other cool thing about the LCS model is uh, we can look back. Now, no one was here to measure nutrients back in the 1850s, but it's really easy to say, well, back in the 1850s, all these hectares of feedlots were probably forest. Let's put these hectares into that box. And towns, let's put those hectares into the box. And crops, let's put those hectares into that box. And you do that, that simple math, and you would say, well, if the North Saskatchewan River was all forest, there'd be about 920 tons of nutrients coming in each year. Now, there's about 7,000 tons. That's a seven times increase. Is this exact? Of course not. Some feedlots are bigger than others. Some fields get a lot more fertilizer than others. It gives us a ballpark idea of, wow, that's a lot more nutrients than there used to be. And if I want to do something effective, I probably shouldn't go after the towns or the feedlots. I better talk to the farmers. That's where my solution lies. My solution lies with the farmers. That's the best bang for the buck. That's what a strategic level cumulative effects model can do for you. And it smells right. We look at our rivers and say, can there really be seven times more nutrients? Here's a picture of the Beaver Lodge River, looking like something on a St. Patrick's Day parade. <laughs> Here's Lake Isle, massive fish kill in the spring of uh, 2011. All the fish dead. The ducks were dead. Massive amount of nutrients coming in, big algae bloom, all the oxygen's gone. Now that's just a simple example. The full ELSI's model uses 20 different landscape types and 15 different footprint types and measures them over time. But that's the basic 
mathematics behind it. Very simple, simple grade two math. So the watershed had this cool goal, you know, they want the watershed to be, you know, have ecological integrity, which is good for all sorts of things that humans do. And they wanted sort of four main objectives, and they had, I think, 17 different indicators, you know, biodiversity and natural landscapes and so on. Those were sort of buzzwords, didn't mean a lot to me personally. How can I make this more meaningful to me as, as a person? Um, what matters to me as a person is my kids and grandkids. And I thought, you know, biodiversity, I can ask biodiversity landscape questions in a different way. I can say, hey, um, can I go fishing in a future watershed? That's biodiversity. At a wild natural spot, that's natural landscapes. And have my kids play in the shallows, that's water quality of a clear flowing river. That's water quantity. I can basically ask this question, which is really meaningful to me and my family and my future, of this model. So we did that. We put all the information about um, what is going to happen with how do the cities want to grow? How does agriculture want to grow? How do oil and gas want to grow? What is the climate going to do? And we can put those all in the model and say, okay, for the next 100 years, what might the report card for the fish that I catch look like. Remember a report card up in here of 80 to 100% would mean, yeah, we'd go fishing there if it's in here. Um, maybe, a, like I say, a kid on a bike riding down to the river to catch a jackfish, but down here we're losing species. The score for the Battle River was about 42%. We looked at a bunch of different scenarios for the um, North Saskatchewan. The business as expected scenario where a little less growth than we're seeing now. It's not so good now. It gets a little worse, but sort of levels off after 50 or so years. Best practices was we put Band-Aid solutions on the watershed, and we get a Band-Aid type solution on the watershed. It just improves it a little bit. Uh, climate change comes along, well, it's a little worse. Basically, will I be able to take my kids fish in the future? No, I can't really now. It doesn't get a lot worse, but it certainly doesn't get any better. Well, why? Um, the water quantity was fine, there's lots of water in the river, but the quality was quite poor in terms of fish habitat. There was just too many people and too many roads. And again, this smelled about right. We look at the watershed now and there are too many people and too many roads when it comes to being a fish. This is an amazing picture of uh, Family Day at Pigeon Lake in central Alberta back in February. These are pickup trucks parked on the ice. These are people out fishing. This is a close-up. These are all people at pre-drilled holes at a fishing derby. Fish attract huge numbers of people. If you have good access, lots of roads, lots of people, we can vacuum our lakes out in terms of fish. Wintertime, summertime is the same thing. Lots of people in Alberta want to recreate. There's roads everywhere. Fish are tasty and fun to catch. They can't take that kind of pressure. The model said they can't take it. We know that in reality, too. Well, what about um, natural landscapes? Can I at least take my kids to a wild place or duck hunting or to a swamp? I think it's really important to take your kids out to swamps, to take them to get leech bit, to take them to get mosquito bit, to teach them about nature. Growing up, catching frogs is part of how you get in touch with the natural world. Well, will there be places to catch frogs in the future? Um, I modeled wetlands as a percentage of the North Saskatchewan Basin. As crops grow, they eat up wetlands. As towns grow, they eat up wetlands. Convert them into stormwater retention ponds. Concrete pools are not the same as swamps where you can go and catch frogs. They don't have the same ecological goods and services. They don't act as water filters. They don't act to clean the water up. This is percent of the basin in wetlands. We started about 3% now. The scenarios showed it went downhill. This is a fascinating one because before we ran the analysis, we talked to the people in the room, the North Saskatchewan watershed people, and said, what do you think would be a good percentage of wetlands in the basin? And they thought, um, well, good would be more than 10%. Sort of between 5 and 10%, that would be fair. And less than 5% would be poor. Those are the thresholds they told us beforehand. Well, we're poor now, and it gets worse. Everything we do makes it worse went from about 8% to 1%, 3%, and going to less than 1% in the next century. What about water quality? Can I take my kids at least to play in clean water in the main rivers or in the, in the creeks? This is just an index of the phosphorus, the main thing that makes the water turn green. If it was one, that would be sort of 
the natural condition. As it gets worse and worse, the number gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Undisturbed would be at the top, just heavily disturbed would be at the bottom. Um, it's pretty bad now, and it doesn't change at all. Uh, best practices, we could do all these cool Band-Aid solutions, and we could cut our nutrient input into the creeks in half. That would double the water quality. It would go from terribly sucky to sucky. <laughs> Doubling bad, really bad, doesn't get us out of the problem. And with climate change, it goes from bad to worse. So it's not good now, there's real no improvement. This was quite surprising. One of the modeling results we found was as the cities grew and grew, they ate up all those terrible crops and terrible feedlots that were making all the nutrients. And we looked at it, um, certainly we saw over the years, the working farms and ranches, agriculture, really their contribution to the runoff really dropped off. As our cities expanded, our subdivisions ate up all the farms, they went away. So why didn't the water get better? The one bad source of nutrients was replaced with roads, industry, acreages, three smaller sources. But the three smaller sources added up to the one big source going. The fish don't care where the algae comes from. It used to come from one source, now it comes from three smaller. We simply replaced it and to the fish, it stayed bad. So I ran a bunch of scenarios and I said, suppose for a moment that the future unfolds like this. And I asked this question of the model. In the business as usual scenario, just mad growth, we found that the cities grew at 3%, which is what they're being growing at. Uh, rural residential grew at 7%, ate up all the farms. That was unsustainable. All the questions I asked, then things got bad and then they got worse. Things were bad and then they got worse. Uh, business as expected scenario, let's just throttle back on growth a little bit, put it more reasonable. And it was unsustainable. Urban sprawl, sprawl ate up most of the watershed. What about uh, best practices? Like I say, the, the Band-Aid solution, the green city scenario. We controlled urban sprawl a bit and it was partially sustainable um, for biodiversity, but yeah. I still couldn't take my kids fishing or to a wild place. And best practices, green cities, and climate change, in that scenario, actually, all the indicators got bad, including water quantity. We started to use the North Saskatchewan for irrigation, and water quantity started to go downhill. So all the scenarios I ran said this. Plants and animals disappear to make room for your fat ass. <laughs> and I don't want to leave you with that message. <laughs> that seems like a real downer. But it also pointed us to some solutions. The two central problems we had were this. That is unsustainable. That kind of growth compared to Manitoba and Saskatchewan's population growth is unsustainable if we want those other good things on the landscape, places to take our kids, natural landscapes, clean water, good fishing. We have to solve that. And we have to fix the things we've been doing on the landscape like that. A really good illustration of this is this neat shot. It's a satellite image of up by uh, the Beaver River. You can see the Beaver River in the top part of the picture with a nice big riparian area over the top, the nice filters working. But we've lost a lot of things in the watershed. A lot of the places where the nutrients are coming from are these big fields. And you can sort of see um, we need to fix these wetlands that have been drained, that aren't the filters anymore. We need to fix these streams that have been lost, that the farmer just plowed right over so we can get more crop production. Those disconnected wetlands we have to fix, but we also have to fix this guy who's going bankrupt. These are four critical problems. The only reason this poor guy was plowing across this field was not because he hates ducks or he hates wetlands, hates walleye. He has to get every dollar off of this quarter section of land. So of course he's got to do this. How do we prevent him from going bankrupt but still keep the natural things on the landscape for the things we value. And economists tell us the solution is simply to pay farmers and ranchers for the things we value, for good conservation. That's pretty straightforward. We have to pay real dollars to create a healthy environment. We know that natural shorelines and wetlands create clean water. We've got to start thinking about ways to pay farmers for growing clean water. Maybe that's tax breaks, maybe that's subsidies. Um, if you put land in natural sedges or keep the wetlands in, that's got to be a financial incentive for him to do that. And the financial incentive is because I want the clean water. My grandchildren want fish. Our cities need those clean water. We need those things. 
Also, we found that natural vegetation, things like Alberta's provincial grass, rough fescue, is a great source of uh, carbon sequestration. The roots of the rough, rough fescue can just store carbon down there. If we could think of some <laughs> industry in Alberta that could store, that needed carbon stored. Natural grasslands store, you know, 100 tons of carbon per hectare. Um, Sequestration technology is apparently around $41 a ton. That means one hectare of grassland can provide nearly $4,000 worth of carbon storage. Most farmers will tell you one hectare of field will produce about $20 to $30 of profit right now, not $4,100 of carbon storage. This is another really important value of farmers' land right now. Clean air, clean water. We have to start paying people to grow produce what we value. And I don't mean for it to happen everywhere. This could be um, all those headwaters I spoke about in Alberta, you know, the top of White Mud Creek. Perhaps the county of Leduc could simply say, yeah, in that area, that's a headwater area. Do you farmers in that area want to go organic? Do you want to go grazing on native fescue rather than plowing it to the edge? Because they will produce things we value. Not for tax incentives for that, just a lighter footprint in the many, many headwaters we have in Alberta. These are kind of the discussions that we should be having in the rest of Alberta to change the way that we're doing things in the future. And that's a really valuable, that's a really valuable discussion to have, and, and I'm, I'm very optimistic by groups like the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance. These are regular folks with a great passion for the environment. And it's that passion and neat ideas and people with different experiences, all looking at a common problem. We value the future. We value clean water. We value clean air. What can we do to get it? So I want to end with, I think, a real important message from one of my favorite authors, um, Edward Abbey. If you haven't read Desert Solitaire or Monkey Wrench Gang, go out to Abbey Books or Amazon.com and get a copy of these. Buy Monkey Wrench Gang. Go buy a chainsaw, cut down some billboards. He wrote some great essays. And I just want to leave you with this. One final paragraph of advice. Don't burn yourselves out. Be like I am, a reluctant enthusiast, a half-hearted fanatic. Save the other half in your lives for pleasure and adventure. It is not enough to fight for the land. It's even more important to enjoy it. Well, you can. Well, it's still here. So get out there and hunt and fish. Mess around with your friends. Explore the forests. Encounter the grizz climb the mountains, run the rivers, enjoy yourselves. Keep your brain in your head and your head firmly attached to the body, the body active and alive, and I promise you this much. I promise you this one sweet victory over our enemies, over those desk-bound people with their hearts in a safe deposit box and their eyes glazed by desk calculators. I promise you this, you will outlive the bastards. Thank you very much. <laughs>